by Mr Order. McCormack, who should Senator be doing a much better job for the Time people of the bush. Time has expired. Questions without notice. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. And I refer yet to yesterday's release of the NAB monthly business survey for August 2019, where the chief economist, Alan Oster, said, and I quote, it looks like the tax cuts have had little impact on household consumption or have not been large enough to offset increasing weakness in the retail sector. When is the government going to take up or come up with a plan to boost an economy that is floundering on its watch? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, the only thing that is floundering, as I said yesterday, is Labor's socialist economic agenda, uh, which was comprehensively rejected by the Australian people at the last election. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, our, our, you know, there are always uh, various comments that are issued by various banks. I mean, I could refer you to the UBS analysis, uh, which has suggested in the September quarter uh, growth is uh, expected to uh, nearly double compared to the June quarter on the back of. Uh, uh, of course, our income tax cuts. Because you know what our income tax cuts have done? They have put $15 billion more money into workers' pockets. $15 billion more money into workers' pockets. They have uh, increased the take-home pay of workers around Australia. You would have thought that the Labor Party uh, would say that's a good thing. Of course, of course uh, the Australian economy is facing uh, headwinds. Of course, we are facing global economic headwinds. And other economies around the world, substantial economies around the world, like Germany, like the United Kingdom, and others, are actually going backwards. We are continuing to grow. The reason we are continuing to grow is because of our plan to build a stronger economy. And it's because fiscal policy and monetary policy is working in the same direction. As well as uh, lower interest rates, we've got lower income taxes, we've got more investment in infrastructure, uh, we've got uh, an ambitious free trade agenda helping our exporting businesses sell more Australian products and services around the world, which is of course very ably prosecuted uh, by none other than the Minister for Trade, my good friend and colleague uh, Senator Birmingham. Uh, we've got uh, an ambitious agenda to uh, reduce uh, uh, the regulatory burden on business to make it easier for business to be successful and hire more Australians. Let me tell you, the Australian I mean, this is, these sorts of questions show that the Australian people still does not accept the verdict of the Australian people at the last election. Because all of these arguments were put to the Australian people in the lead up to the last election. And you know what? They opted for our plan of lower taxes, pro growth, pro business, pro jobs. And they, act, they voted against your uh, agenda, your socialist Order. agenda Senator of the politics Coleman, of envy. The answer expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Master Builders Association agrees with NAB that tax cuts alone will not deal with weakness in the economy. MBA uh, CEO Danita Warren has told the AFR, and I quote, "What's urgently needed is an acceleration of infrastructure projects." to the construction phase. When is the government, or why is the government ignoring calls to support the economy? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, sure, Mr President. Clearly, I mean, Senator Gallagher was provided a, a draft question by, the, or a question by the tactics committee, and he clearly didn't listen to a single word I said in my uh, primary answer. Uh, we are not suggesting that tax cuts are the only thing required uh, to uh, build a stronger economy into the future. Of course we are committed uh, to investing more in infrastructure. That is why we've boosted infrastructure investment from $75 billion to $100 billion, and about half, half of that over the forward estimates. Half of that over the forward estimates. That, I mean, the, the thing is, I mean, let, uh, well, here here, here we go. So let me tell you, as I, you also didn't listen, Senator Wong, to my primary answer. The UBS, the UBS, another bank, uh, is predicting that there would be a near doubling uh, in economic growth in the September quarter on the back of uh, personal income tax cuts. There's different analysts making different uh, comments, but you know what? What will matter is what comes out at the end of the day when the September quarter results are released in early December. Order, Senator Gallagher, final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Why is the government so determined to ignore the NAB, the NBA and the Reserve Bank of Australia and even its own backbencher, Senator Rennick? When will the government act to support an economy that is floundering on its watch? 
Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. The only thing that this government will ignore uh, is the floundering socialist economic agenda of the Labor Party, which was so resoundingly rejected by the Australian people. We will continue to develop, we will continue to implement our plan for a stronger economy and for more jobs uh, with lower taxes, pro business, pro growth, pro opportunity, pro aspiration. I mean, you know, as we know. Order, Senator Wong. I'll give Senator Wong precedence. Senator Gallagher. Oh, I'm oh. happy for Senator. Oh, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I've listened carefully to your instructions about points of order, and I take you to Standing Order 72.3c. Uh, and all it says there, for our guidance, Mr. President, is that answers shall be directly relevant to each question. And I hardly see how our conduct alleged conduct by Senator Cormann is directly relevant to the answer of to the question I asked. Okay. On the point of order, I, I may have prepared for this. Um, on, on the point of order, you are correct that ministers must be directly, must be directly relevant. <laughs> My apologies. Using one word of a question does not make an que answer to a question relevant to a question. However, it was a very open-ended question, Senator Gallagher, and in that sense the minister is being directly relevant to it. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As I said yesterday, the Australian economy continues to grow, unlike many other economies around the world. Uh, more jobs are being created, more, a record number of Australians in work. Uh, the wages growth, wages growth in the 18-19 financial year was the strongest it's been, 2.3 per cent, above inflation to 1.6 per cent, the strongest in 13-14, Labor's last uh, budget year. Uh, and, and of course, uh, as I say, uh, <laughs> Labor's socialist agenda is not only floundering with the Australian people, it's even floundering with the member for uh, Port Adelaide, hardly, hardly a free market capitalist Order. advocate. Senator, Senator Gallagher. Order, uh, Senator Cormann is misleading the House. Time, uh, Senator there, Gallagher, I'm afraid time for the answer has expired. So one there is no seat of Port Adelaide anymore, Mr. President. <laughs> But Senator Askew, before I, I come to you, if I could ask colleagues for a moment, I'd like to draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of the Australian Political Exchange Council's seventh delegation from the Republic of Korea. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, in particular, to the Senate. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister please advise the Senate how the Morrison government is delivering stability and certainty for Australians looking to find work through the Try Test Learn Fund? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much to Senator Askew for her question and her particular interest about removing barriers to employment for Australians who are looking for work. The Morrison government is absolutely committed in working with all Australians to break down the barriers that are preventing people who are on working age payments to get off welfare and to get into a job. And we are supporting them through a range of initiatives, including the one that Senator Askew mentioned, which is the $96 million Try, Test and Learn Fund. And what we've been doing through this fund is trialling new and innovative ways to assist people on welfare on their pathway towards either education or employment. Um, one great example that is already on foot uh, is the Work Work project run by Too Good Kitchen in Sydney and Melbourne. This particular program uh, employs mature aged women to gain financial independence and create a pathway for them back into the workforce. These women complete a 16-week paid on-the-job training uh, program as kitchen assistants, and then at the end of that they are guaranteed six months paid work in one of the kitchens of Too Good Kitchen. Um, I want to tell you about Tracy. Tracy is a 52-year-old, um, and she'd been struggling with drug addiction for most of her life. Tracy joined the team on the Work Work project and, in her own words, has said she's never looked back. What Tracy actually said to us was that I've had trouble for a long time to get back into a job, but this program has really helped change things for me. I've made friends for life with these girls. It's so good for us. So on this side of the chamber, we actually understand that all Australians do face particular barriers to employment, um, and it is because of our strong and stable economy that we are able to afford to invest in programs like the Try, Test and Learn program, the one that has actually helped Tracy be able to get back into the workforce. Uh, so 
We know Order, that Senator Rustin. <coughs> time for the answers expired. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister update the Senate on the programs that the Morrison government is investing in to help young people get off welfare and into work? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thanks, Senator Askew, for her follow-up question. I can advise this chamber that we've got over 30 programs through the Try, Test and Learn program uh, agenda to help young people specifically and support them in their uh, quest to get a job. One such program is actually the Fairbridge Leadership Engagement and Development Program, and it helps young people find a career path by exposing them to a number of different trades in the hope that they may be able to identify a particular work path that is going to be of interest to them. Because we know that young people often don't know what they want to do because they don't know what is available to them. So by exposing them to a range of different programs, we are hoping that they'll find one that they're interested in. And by accompanying these programs with you know, literacy and numerous support, counselling, mentoring uh, and the like, we were able to assist them. Um, great Rory's mother, actually, who is part of uh, one of our programs, though I'm ready to work program, said that Rory has been given the opportunity to practice and learn a range of employability skills. Order. It'll mean Senator he'll get a Rustin. job. Senator, to ask you a final supplementary question. Minister, how are these programs changing the lives of the people involved? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to tell you uh, a story about Jacqueline, who participated in Next Steps program run by, run by HR Development at Work. This program gives older uh, job seekers a combination of training, mentoring, coaching to tackle some of the psychological challenges of unemployment. Um, Jacqueline was made redundant at the end of last year. Jacqueline is 57. And in her own words, she said she didn't feel as though she had any hope whatsoever of re-entering the workforce. Jacqueline has been part of the Next Steps program, and this is what she said after she has been successful in getting a job with the Education Department. Um, to be told that you are the best candidate for the job is a huge boost to your self-esteem. I've now been working for over six weeks and absolutely love my job. We understand Australians face barriers to work. That's why we're working with them with these programs to overcome them. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Foreign Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. And in 2016, an arbitral tribunal at the Permanent Court of Arbitration ruled that many of China's claims to the South China Sea had no legal basis under international law. In 2016, former Minister for Foreign Affairs, Ms Bishop, called on the Philippines and China to abide by the ruling. Does this remain the government's position? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Yes, Mr President. The government has been clear in uh, stating uh, our position in relation to uh, the South China Sea, which is a waterway of significant priority for Australia, as uh, all senators would be aware. Uh, the uh, senator has uh, outlined a number of, uh, of aspects uh, in relation to that with which we have uh, concurred in the past. That continues to be the case. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Last night, Liberal Member of Parliament Gladys Liu, the member for Chisholm, failed on three occasions to back in the arbitral tribunal's ruling. Why? Senator Payne. Well, Mr President, uh, as Senator Wong, uh, one assumes with the benefit of media monitoring, would be well aware, the member for Chisholm has uh, issued a statement on this matter today. Uh, she has uh, been clear in relation to uh, uh, the issues that were raised. She uh, began her interview by saying, her statement by saying, "Last night in a television interview, I was not clear, and I should have chosen my words better. As a new member of Parliament, I will be learning from this experience." Australia's long-standing position on the South China Sea is consistent and clear. We do not take sides on competing territorial claims, but we call order, on all Senator claimants Payne. Senator to Wong. resolve. Senator Wong is on a point of order. Senator Wong. Point of order, direct relevance. Order. I'm very I... serious. Um, order, please. I would like to hear the point of order. I'm glad you brought up that president, Senator Abetz. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Precisely. Um, may I? Can I hear the point of order? And thank, thank you. Others will have the opportunity to contribute if they wish. Uh, the question is why. It's not a question of what statement did she subsequently issue. My question is why did she fail on three occasions to restate the government's position? 
On the point of order, Senator Payne. President, on the point of order, the member for Chisholm's statement uh, is perfectly, perfectly clear. She indicates that in the interview she was not clear and that she should have chosen her words better. On the point of order, Senator Wong, you reminded the, the minister of the question. I believe in this instance, uh, with the statement the minister is making, that the minister is being directly relevant. There's an opportunity to debate questions and answers after question time, and I think that's the appropriate place if people are not satisfied with answers. Senator Payne, continue. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I uh, think I was at the point of uh, the member for Chisholm's statement, which. Uh, says we do not take sides on competing territorial claims, but we call on all claimants to resolve disputes peacefully and in accordance with international law. Senator Wong. Thank you. What steps has this minister taken to ensure the member for Chisholm is a fit and proper person to sit in the Australian Parliament? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. Any suggestion that that is not the case is offensive. The member for Chisholm is duly elected as the representative of the people of Chisholm in the last election. Senator, order. Senator Di Natale. Order. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, uh, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Natural Disasters and Emergency Services, Senator McKenzie. Minister, following on from Minister Littlebrow's comments that climate change was irrelevant, he said yesterday, and I quote, I don't know if climate change is man-made, unquote. Uh, following on from those comments, the Minister for the Environment, Minister Lee, said yesterday, and again I quote, I don't know if the fires have anything to do with climate change. Minister, do you agree with Minister Littlebrow's comments and Minister Lee's comments, or do you believe that humans are causing climate change and that climate change increases the frequency and severity of wildfires, putting the lives of Australians at risk. The Minister representing the Minister for Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to um, see those comments directly. Um, well, Order. I do apologise. I haven't been across the newspapers in the last couple of days. But, but I can answer the question, Senator Di Natale. Uh, you know, I believe in the science of climate change. I always have. I think our most um, important uh, thing we need to focus on in is ensuring that we take strong action on climate change. And that is exactly why, what our government has been doing with our Climate Solutions Fund, with a range of um, uh, programs across my own portfolio in agriculture and right across government to assist lower emissions uh, right across the economy uh, so we can actually meet our Paris targets and take strong action on climate change. That's what the Australian um, people voted for. That is what we as a government are taking very, very seriously. But what I really struggle with, Senator Di Natale, that at this point in time, and uh, Senator Watt, I, I did have a chance to glance at Twitter over the last couple of days, and I did see you take Senator Di Natale to task. That to take Senator Di Natale to task on politicising the horrific bushfires that Queensland and New South Wales are going through right now. Volunteer firefighters, farmers, householders, business owners are running for their livelihoods from the devastation these fires are wreaking. And rather than actually focus on assisting that effort on the ground today, tomorrow, next week, you come in here day after day and waste your question on making cheap political points on whether our government takes uh, climate change seriously. Well, we do. We signed up to pa the Paris Agreement. We ha have a whole suite of initiatives across every single Order. portfolio Senator to address it. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, well, Minister, let's talk about the firefighters who have said that you don't find a climate denier at the end of, of a fire hose. And now, firefighters are very clear about this. I want to know whether you agree, and you still haven't answered the question, do you agree with your cabinet co colleagues who deny a link between humans causing climate change and climate change resulting in bushfires, or do you agree with firefighters? In the words of the Prime Minister, Minister whose side are you on? Senator McKenzie. Oh, Senator Di Natale, another cheap, dramatic point, mate. You know, you'd think you'd actually have 
some sensible questions here on policy. But no, I, I, you know, I don't know how often I can say it, that I accept the science of climate change. I am part of a government. I'm a cabinet minister in a government that takes climate change seriously. We have a $3.5 billion climate reduction fund. We have emission targets that we've set 26 to 28 per cent based on 2005 levels through the Paris Agreement, that right across the economy we've got a suite of initiatives uh, to ensure that we meet those targets. That's what we're committed to doing, taking strong action, because things are changing. Farmers are dealing with a changing and variable climate each and every day. And when you see uh, their, their seasons are changing, when they may have uh, done silage at the end of November down in Gippsland, it's now being moved moved times, lambing seasons have changed, etc. So their practices are changing on farms. Order. We know Senator that. McKenzie. Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. Minister, it's the firefighters who are speaking up right now because it's their lives on the line, Minister. And indeed, uh, Lee Johnson, who was in charge of Queensland's fire services, said that, that weather conditions they're now facing are unheard of. You can't fight it. The heat generated means you can't put people or equipment in front of these fires. Minister, given that firefighters are speaking out up right now, why did your government disband the Secretary's group on climate risk who are preparing for catastrophes just like this one? Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, you know what, Senator Di Natale, if we took your approach to addressing climate change, we'd shut everything down tomorrow. And you know what? The fires would still be going. The volunteers would still be having to find non-existent water from empty dams because of drought. So despite your protestations, there, it's, it's, a, it's a flaccid argument. It really is, absolutely. Because the reality is if we took your approach, closed everything down, the fire would still be burning, the firefighters would still be uh, in danger. Order. As Senator were McKenzie, far please resume your seat. Senator Di Natale, on a point of order. Point of order on relevance again. I, I, the question was very clear, and I asked why the government disbanded the secretary's group on climate risk, who were preparing for climate catastrophes like the one we're experiencing right now. Thank you, Senator Di Natale. On the point of order, Senator McKenzie, you have been speaking for half the answer. Um, there's been some liberality in the issues raised, but I'll ask you to turn to the question, Senator McKenzie. Have you? Concluded? Oh, sorry. No, I'm, uh, in terms of um, the secretary's uh, group that you, you speak of, I'll have to take the, that aspect of the question on notice. But I know I can speak for my own secretary in the Department of Agriculture, who is absolutely focused on rolling out a suite of initiatives and programs throughout uh, the Department of Agriculture's program, suite of programs to address and mitigate climate change. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health. Order. Order. At the back of the chamber. I can't. At the back of the chamber, please. I'll start throw, using names of people if necessary. Senator Smith. Starting with Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the Minister advise the Senate how a strong economy enables the Morrison government to provide the certainty and stability of a world-class health system, and is the Minister aware of any recent milestones that support these successes? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Smith for the question. Uh, Mr. President, I am pleased to report that the Morrison government continues to translate our strong economic management into delivering record outcomes for Australians when it comes to the Australian health system. Australia has, without a doubt, one of the best health systems in the world, and key to ensuring the success of this system is, of course, Medicare. I'm proud to inform the Senate that last week Australia reached a record high bulk billing rate of 86.2 per cent in the 2018-19 year. This is the fourth consecutive quarter to reach a record high. In the last year, patients made 136.5 million bulk bill GP visits. That is an increase of over 3 million from the previous year. Across the whole health system, Australians accessed 335.8 million 
bulk build services, including GP specialist pathology and diagnostic imaging services. Mr. President, that's an increase of over 8.9 million more than the previous record set last year. These figures show that Medicare, under the Morrison government, is supporting the health and well-being of Australians more than ever. This is just the beginning of the Morrison government's support for our health system. On 1 July this year, the government increased the patient rebate for further GP items on the Medicare benefit schedule. The Medicare benefit schedule review will ensure Medicare services are effective and appropriate for patients now and into the future. Mr. President, this is only possible. This investment in our health system is only possible because the Morrison government understands the importance of a strong economy and the dividends that a strong economy then can give to the Australian people. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate whether this success extends to listing life-saving medicines on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme? Senator Cash. Uh, well, yes, Mr. President, and yes, Senator Smith, indeed it does. And in fact, I believe that this is one of the proudest achievements of the Morrison government. And again, it is an achievement that is only possible by ensuring a strong economy. This is one of the greatest dividends that you can give to the Australian people, listing a drug on the PBS. And, uh, in the month of August, the Morrison government is investing a further Mr. President, $40 million for two new listings on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, commencing on 1 September. For example, we've listed Buvidol, a medicine that allows patients who are receiving medical, social and psychological support to manage the withdrawal symptoms and cravings that arise from opiate dependency. Over 110,000 Australians are struggling with this, and there were 1,119 deaths in 2016. Life-saving medicines can only be listed like we're doing because of the Order. strong economy. Senator Smith, final supplementary Thank question. Thank you, Mr President. Is the minister aware of any alternative uh, approaches? Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President. Senator, what is right? And Senator, what? this is not a proud achievement of your government. This is not a proud achievement of the former Labor government. Why? Because, Senator Watt, you stopped listing life-saving drugs on the PBS. You stopped, as a government, listing life-saving drugs on the PBS because you did not, as a political party, understand the benefits of a strong economy. In 2011, the party that you belonged to when it was in government had to put in black and white in the 2011 budget papers the listing of some medicines would be deferred until fiscal circumstances permit. And guess what, colleagues? Fiscal circumstances under the coalition government have permitted the listing of life-saving drugs on the PBS. We will always understand the benefits of a strong economy, in particular when it Order. comes to listing life-saving drugs. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence. Um, I'm sure the Minister is aware that uh, there are a number of companies in, under her portfolio who appear not to be paying tax. Uh, I'll give an example from tax transparency data of BAE Systems Australia Holdings Limited, who over the four years of ta tax transparency uh, uh, had an income of uh, $3.9 billion and paid $0 in tax. Um, what uh, assessments, if any, has your department made of the tax pra pra practices of large defence contractors who appear to be experts in minimising their tax payments here in Australia? Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr President, and uh, I thank Senator Patrick for the question. Uh, I'm sure Senator Patrick will be delighted to know that, as from 1 July this year, under recent changes to defence policy, Tender, tenderers must provide a certificate either from the ATO or their foreign equivalent of their tax standing. This is also applies now to first tier contractors and companies cannot, cannot at all tender without it. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Is it not the case that the Defence Department is signing contracts directly with companies registered in tax havens? Is it not the case, for example, that Defence has a contract with a value of almost $500 million with Intelsat LLC of 90 Pitt Bay Road, 
Pembroke, Hamilton, Bermuda. What measures does Defence have in place to ensure Defence does not engage contractors registered in identified tax havens? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, I thank uh, Senator Patrick for that question. And uh, normally, I would have thought that question would have gone to uh, the representative of the Treasurer in this House. However, I am very proud of this government's record in uh, getting multinationals to pay their fair share of tax. Yeah. We are global leaders in the international fight against corporate and multinational tax avoidance. In fact, Senator Patrick might be interested to know that since 1 July 2016, the ATO has raised about $13.5 billion in tax liabilities alleged against large public co corporations and multinationals. And of that amount of money, $8.6 billion in tax liabilities is uh, from multinationals. Order. So, uh, Senator Reynolds, uh, Senator Patrick, on a point of order. Mr. President, the burden of my question went to the measures taken to avoid contracting companies in tax havens. Um, on the point of order, um, to be directly relevant to the question, one must be relating to part of the question asked. Um, context is always available to ministers, um, but I'll ask the minister to, that Senator Patrick has reminded her of the nature of the specific nature of the question. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And I, I suspect Senator Patrick didn't hear the answer to my, his first question because I actually answered the question very clearly. Said the uh, Defence Department, and I'll repeat what I said in the first question. From 1 July this year, under recent changes by this government to defence policy, tenders to provide certificates are to provide certificates Order. of satisfactory tax Senator record Reynolds. from the ATO. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, Mr. President, it is not unlawful to, for defence to sign a contract with a, uh, an entity in, the tax, in, in a tax haven, and they can fill in the forms. Uh, and they can still be awarded the contract. But I don't think it's acceptable for most Australians who uh, want companies to give, uh, to, to contribute to our uh, social structure, to our defence and so forth. What are you doing specifically in, in relation to preventing us uh, encouraging uh, contracts with tax havens? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, noting most of that was uh, a statement rather than a question, I will refer you to my first question. That this government, that uh, this minister, under this government, has changed defence policy to ensure that we do validations and we check that of the good standing, the taxation standing of companies that we do business with. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister please update the Senate on Australia's submarine capabilities? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank very much thank Senator Hughes for that question. And I can confirm for all in this chamber that the Morrison government is absolutely committed to the security, stability, and prosperity of Australia. That's why this government is investing $90 billion in our national shipbuilding endeavour. We are an island nation. We rely on mar uh, maritime trade for our prosperity, and that trade requires a secure maritime environment. With an estimated 300 submarines expected to be operating in the Indo-Pacific region by 2035, submarines are an enduringly important strategic capability for Australia. Today that capability is very ably provided by a fleet of six column class submarines that is providing extraordinary service to our nation. Three of the six submarines are consistently available now for tasking with one in shorter-term maintenance and two in long-term maintenance and upgrades. The Collins-class submarines incorporate the most advanced technology of any conventional submarine and continue to excel in their operations in a way that should make all Australians incredibly proud. We are now pursuing the next generation of submarine, the attack class, which is the centrepiece of our naval shipbuilding enterprise. Like Collins, the attack class submarine will retain that competitive edge in our submarine capability in future. But as we construct 12 new attack class submarines, this government will be putting in place a very prudent transition plan to ensure the effective operation of our submarine fleet in this uh, co increasingly contested environment remains in place. The delivery of our submarine capability is a key priority of government, and it is my most solemn of duty to make sure that this project is delivered and we receive the capability that our nation requires. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. 
Can the minister update the Senate on the government's plan to maintain an effective Collins submarine? Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much. And yes, I can, Senator Hughes. The Collins class submarine continues to achieve Royal Australian Senator. Navy requirements. The Collins class submarine is technically only half its way through its life and remains a highly potent and capable platform. But to manage the transition between the Collins class and the delivery of the first attack class, we will conduct life of type extensions to the Collins class submarines. That's why this government can continue to sustain the fleet with a regime of intermediate, mid and also full cycle dockings. This means that the Collins class submarines are spending more days at sea today than ever before. They're conducting more exercises and participating in more operations that directly contribute to our nation's defence capability and our security. The government has 12 active Collins-related major capital projects, including communication upgrades and sonar upgrades, which will continue to extend the life of the Collins and continue to make it a capability that Order. Australia requires. Senator Reynolds. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on the government's commitment to incorporating local content into the future submarine program? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Hughes. I can assure this Senate that this government is absolutely focused on maximising the level of industry involvement in all of our shipbuilding programs. The Morrison government is the first government to put faith in Australian defence industry as a fundamental input to capability. It is in our nation's interest that all states and territories are capable of contributing to the shipbuilding and sustainment endeavour. All states contribute. 15,000 15, Australian workers will be at the forefront of modern naval ship design and construction practices, creating new opportunities for defence and adjacent industries. Our attack class program will be built upon a framework of agreements between Naval Group and ASC, which identifies ways that both can collaborate to support Australian sovereign submarine capability. Mandating a minimum proportion of Australia's industry is actually counterproductive. As it focuses on measurements Order. rather Senator than Senator Reynolds, profit time for the answer has expired. Sovereign. Order. Senator Bernardi. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Finance, representing the Assistant Treasurer, Senator Cormann. In a recent column entitled Tax Office Threat to Self Managed Super Funds, Robert Gottliebson raised the concerns about the ATO's latest campaign to investigate SMSFs. Gottliebson wrote the ATO has sent letters to almost 20,000 of these funds, saying that our records indicate your investment strategy may hold 90 per cent of more of its funds in one asset or a single asset class, such as property. The ATO states this may not meet the diversification requirement in the superannuation industry regulations, risking an administrative penalty of $4,200. They then demand a detailed investment strategy be provided to allay the ATO's concerns. Minister, how has the ATO selected these SMSFs for investigation? What is the basis of the no more than 90 per cent of funds in one asset or single asset class diversification requirement? And where is this fixed percentage of 90 per cent found in the superannuation law or regulations? The Minister representing the Assistant Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Bernardi for that question. Uh, as a regulator for self-managed super funds, uh, the ATO uh, has responsibility to ensure uh, trustees comply with the obli obligations uh, and the super laws. One of which is to have an investment strategy that has given due consideration to a number of risks, including the risk of inadequate diversification. Uh, the action referred to in the article relates to recent ITO correspondence uh, in writing to approximately 3% of SMSF trustees and their auditors who, who had invested 90% or more in a single asset or asset class and had used a limited recourse borrowing arrangement to acquire that asset. The ITO intention was to raise awareness of investment strategy obligations. The ITO focused on this group following concerns raised in the report by the Council of Financial Regulators and the ITO to government in relation to uh, leverage and risk in the superannuation system in February this year. Uh, this report highlighted concerns that less diversified self-managed super funds with limited recourse borrowing arrangements are exposed to asset concentration risk, which in the event of a fall in the asset Order. price uh, could uh, lead to a significant loss in the value of the fund. 
Uh, the ITO's records show uh, this SMSFs may hold 90% or more of funds in one asset or single asset class, and as regulator for SMSFs, the ITO thought it appropriate to raise awareness of the investment strategy obligations. I can advise the Senate that the ITO did not demand a detailed Order. investment strategy to be provided to the ITO. The letter simply requests the trustees review the investment strategy. Senator Bernardi, a supplementary question. Well, thank you, uh, Minister. I'm, I'm heartened by your assurance that a detailed investment strategy was not demanded, contrary to the uh, article. But many SMSFs are set up to hold primarily the real estate assets that fund members operate their businesses from. These business owners do not have the time or resources to respond to fishing expeditions or heavy-handed bureauc bureaucratic letters ex like this one from the ATO. Minister, when requesting, making these requests of SMSFs, what oversight do you provide or does the government provide to the ATO? Senator Cormann. Well, as I've said in my uh, you know, primary answer, the ITO uh, is uh, the uh, regulator, um, obviously, and acts independently as an independent statutory agency. The ITO has responsibility to ensure trustees comply with their obligations and uh, the super laws, and one of those laws requires uh, super fund trustees to have an investment strategy in place that has given due consideration to a number of risks, including the risk of inadequate diversification. Now, the government supports giving retirees and those planning for their retirement the choice about whether to invest in a commercial fund, an industry fund, or manage their own, super, their own investments via an SMSF investment vehicle. But as I noted before, the ITO has not requested any additional reporting. It is a requirement under the super laws that all SMSF trustees must have an investment strategy that considers diversification risk, which audits, uh, auditors review annually as part of the annual audit. And the letter from the ITO is a part of the ITO's campaign to assist SMSFs in meeting their regulatory obligations and protecting their superannuation. In addition, the Order, ITO... Senator Cormann, time for the answers expired. Senator Bernardi, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, I raised in Senate estimates last October further evidence of the ATO's heavy-handed regulation of SMSFs. And the Commissioner undertook to revisit the ATO's program of establishment queries and, not knowing when it was last reviewed, undertook to quote, look at the process to make sure it's fit and proper, as the ATO don't want people thinking this is somehow an inquisition of them. Minister, this latest action by the ATO makes many in the SMSFs feel like there is an inquisition. And has the ATO review been done? If so, what were its key findings and how will they affect ATO practices and SMS of a red tape going forward? Senator uh, thank you very much, Senator Bernardi, for that supplementary. In response, in response to the review that was previously requested by Senator Bernardi, I can advise that in February 2018, the ITO completed an internal review of the Secure Front Door Program. The ITO revisited this review in October 2018, following questions raised by Senator Bernardi at the October 2018 budget estimates. In November 2018, the ITO undertook further consultation on the Secure Front Door process with the Tax Practitioner Stewardship Group. The Tax Practitioner Stewardship Group were supportive of the current process and felt there was no need to ensure an alternative engagement regime. The ITO also reviewed its audit processes and supporting guidance material for staff, as well as analysing closed cases, requests for reviews of the decisions and compliance. The ITO found no systemic issues, I'm advised, or deficiencies in the ITO's operational processes, including client interactions. There were no formal compliance regarding the conduct of SMSF registration interviews. The initial review and the ITO's subsequent reconsideration of the secure front door case selection and audit processes found it was subsequently found fit Order. for purpose. Senator Cormann. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. On 18 August, Senator Wong wrote to the Minister requesting comprehensive and detailed briefings for parliamentarians by relevant agencies on Australia's relationship with China. After receiving no response, Senator Wong formally reiterated the request last Friday. The request was made in the interest of ensuring all parliamentarians are well briefed to contribute to a necessary discussion about how we can make our relationship with China work for us. Will the government provide detailed and comprehensive briefings to parliamentarians as requested? Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Kitching for her question. As I have said uh, publicly previously, uh, Mr President, uh, in responding to uh, uh, the um, statement made by the opposition, uh, initially, of course, on, uh, I think, the Insiders program on a Sunday morning, uh, I am not persuaded that uh, there is a need for the uh, um, 
suggestion that the, uh, those opposite have made. As we know, all members of parliament and senators, including uh, those in the opposition, are able to join relevant committees, such as the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence Security or the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committees, uh, all of which get extensive briefings from agencies. And the, uh, Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs is very well, aware, aware, very well aware of that. She sat on those committees for years, Mr. President. Although I do understand, due to internal labour arrangements at the moment, she's not currently on the PJCIS. Uh, so that is the uh, the assessment that uh, the government has made, um, uh, Mr. President, and uh, the position that we've taken. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In this morning's The Australian newspaper, the minister is quoted as saying in respect to Australia's relationship with China, the Prime Minister and I are already leading a mature discussion. Given the minister's website indicates her last public interview was 14 days ago, when did the minister last make even a cursory contribution to the discussion the minister claims to be leading? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'd be more than happy to provide Senator Kitching with a copy of uh, a number of media statements, transcripts, uh, social media statements, and uh, contents of speeches uh, on those matters. Uh, as those opposite uh, are well aware, these are issues which need to be handled in an appropriate and mature way, and that is what the government is doing. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Mr. President, I take note of that answer to that first supplementary, but. Um, how do you lead a discussion when you don't really say anything? Senator Payne. I understand the frustrations of oppositions, uh, Mr. President, and um, they are ones which uh, we on this side uh, are never keen to revisit. Uh, and frankly, that is why the results of May 18 are uh, so important for the people of Australia. Uh, as I have said uh, very clearly on a number of issues, Mr. President, uh, including on a number of issues, Mr. President, including those which have been raised by the opposition, that is what the government is doing. Senator McMahon. Thank you, um, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Can the Minister please advise the Senate how the Liberal National Government is working to reduce gas prices and the importance of stability and certainty in this industry for Australian families and businesses. The Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. I thank uh, Senator McMahon uh, for her question. It's a very important question because uh, the, the, the availability and, and price of gas in Australia is not only important for many Australians to heat and cook in their own homes, it also underpins thousands of jobs. Tens of thousands of jobs are in businesses that have very high expenses in terms of gas use. And so price is extremely important to protect those jobs. To protect those jobs, Mr President, that's why the Liberal National Government uh, a couple of years ago took action to help lower gas prices. At the time, gas prices had peaked. Uh, uh, there, was, there were some shortages, particularly in southern Australia. And, uh, at the time, myself and uh, then the Minister for Industry, Senator Sinodinas, uh, announced a, a new mechanism, the Australian Domestic Gas Security Mechanism, which was for the first time able to restrict gas exports to protect those jobs in Australia. Now, since that time, Mr. President, gas prices in eastern Australia have fallen considerably. Uh, at the time, uh, in early 2017, the gas price in Brisbane, the spot gas price in Brisbane, was $12.15 a gigajoule. Uh, last month, it averaged $5.16, a 42 per cent reduction. Uh, in southern Australia, in Sydney, prices have fallen from $11.53 two years ago to $3.25. Sorry, to 28 per cent down uh, to $8.25, $8.28. Sorry, in last month. Uh, in Adelaide and Victoria, there have been 20 per cent price reductions as well. We now have a situation, Mr. President, which pro where prices in Victoria and Adelaide, in particular, are higher than those in Queensland because the gas is being produced in Queensland. It costs a significant amount to transport that gas long distances. What we need, Mr. President, is for the Victorian government and other governments in New South Wales and South Australia to remove unnecessary restrictions on gas production. To protect those jobs, we need to have a supply of gas. If we don't have the gas supply, gas prices will be higher than they need to be, and people's jobs will be at greater risk than they need to be. We are on the side of jobs in this chamber, Mr. President. We're on the side of the manufacturing industry. That's why we're getting behind gas production. That's why we've maintained a situation where Australian Order. gas is Senator offered to Canada. Australian users. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, what opportunities are on the horizon for the development of gas in Australia, particularly my home of the Northern Territory? Senator Canavan. 
Well, thank you, Mr. President. I, I recognise Senator McMahon as a big advocate for the development of her territory, uh, the Darwin area, and the broader surrounds of the Northern Territory. They have enormous potential up there, while gas production is being unnecessarily restricted in some parts of Australia. Finally, 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 the Northern Territory government has opened up that possibility in Northern Australia. And it's a huge opportunity for our country, Mr. President, because there's something like 180,000 petajoules of gas in the Northern Territory. We use about 500 petajoules of gas here a year in Eastern Australia, so potentially 200 odd years' supply of gas alone uh, in the Northern Territory. It's our first uh, major shale gas basin in Australia, and we can all see what shale gas has done to the manufacturing industry in the U.S. and jobs in the U.S. And I want to have those kind of jobs here in Australia. I know Senator McMahon wants uh, a manufacturing industry in Darwin, and Mr. President, that's why we've taken steps to introduce a national gas reservation scheme, which will see gas produced here in Australia stay in Australia and support Australian jobs and an Australian manufacturing industry. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, what would be the consequences of failing to develop Australia's gas resources? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, we would be bad news for our manufacturing industry. We here in the Liberal National Government support manufacturing in Australia. We support workers. We support jobs. We support them in the mining sector. We support them in the manufacturing sector. Yep. We support them in the agricultural sector. We support them around the country because we know providing people the opportunity to have a job to provide for their families is the best thing we can do as a government for their families and their lives. So that's why we're supporting the development of these gas resources. If we don't do that, we're going to have more decisions like what's happened. In, in southern Australia with Coogee Chemicals, who have had to leave the Victorian market because of the high gas prices, because of the Victorian government's refusal to develop their own resources in their own state. And they are now looking to move to Darwin, where the gas resources will potentially be in the future. Now, that is good news. That is great news. Uh, I met with Coogee Chemicals last week to discuss those plans and make sure we can take advantage of our resolve to use Australian gas in Australia first to provide those Australian jobs. We are committed to doing that. We will build a manufacturing industry in this country. We just need state governments to get on board with this agenda too. Senator Green. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The member for Flynn, Ken O'Dowd, the member for New England, Barnaby Joyce, and the member for Indi, Dr Helen Hayes, have all called on the government to use ministerial discretion and allow Priya, Nardas and their two children to return to their home in rural Queensland community of Bilawila. Why is the Prime Minister ignoring the pleas of rural members of parliament? Are Mr O'Dowd, Mr Joyce and Dr Haynes wrong? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. So thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President, I, I refer uh, the Honourable Senator to a statement made by the Deputy Prime Minister in 2013, and that is that no one who arrives in Australia by boat without a visa uh, will be uh, settled, Order. permanently settled in Australia. Senator, oh, sorry, I, yeah, he was direct answering. Yeah, Senator yeah. Cormann. So, uh, you know, <laughs> here we go. We, we, are, we, are committed, we are committed to protecting uh, the integrity of our borders, and we are, pro we are committed to protecting. Uh, vulnerable people uh, from being again submitted to the vile trial of the people smugglers. Because if we, if we do anything other than apply the law and act consistent with what governments of both persuasions have said in the past, because the Deputy Prime Minister in 2013, uh, who said that no one who comes to Australia by boat without a visa would be settled in Australia, was none other than the current leader of the opposition. None other than the current leader of the opposition, Mr Anthony Albanese. In fact, the Labor Party in 2013 was running adverts, adverts supposedly targeting people smugglers, but they were run in Australia in the lead-up to the 2013 election, uh, making the point that no one who arrives uh, in Australia uh, without a visa by boat would be permanently settled here in Australia. And that was, that was the right judgment at the time that remains the right judgment now, and that is the judgment that the Prime Minister and this government will stick to. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Radio broadcaster Alan Jones from rural Queensland said the Bilawila family are good, hard-working people contributing to a regional community and should not be deported. Mr Jones also said, and I quote, I have written to the Prime Minister. There's been no response. Is Mr Jones wrong? Will the Prime Minister respond to Mr Jones? Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. I'm confident that uh, the Prime Minister uh, regularly uh, corresponds and uh, 
talks to uh, Mr. Jones, uh, but I'm um, leaving that to one side. I mean, the case that the Honourable Senator is referencing uh, has been comprehensively reviewed, not just by government, but by several courts ever since they arrived here without a visa by boat illegally in 2012. Uh, and they've been found not to be uh, valid refugees. They've been found not to be uh, asylum seekers. And in fact, every court up Order. to the High Court. Senator Cormann, Senator what? Senator what on the point of order? Relevance. On relevance, Mr. President, uh, Senator Cormann ignored the first question. Is he going to answer this question, which is whether Mr. Alan Jones is wrong? Uh, um, with all due respect, Senator Watt, I, I, it is entirely in order for the minister to respond to some of the quotations used too. And in my rec notes of the question, the minister is being directly relevant to the other assertions made in the question. You've reminded him of your preferred part of the question, Senator. Th thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister and our government will continue to uphold the law because to do otherwise would put the people smugglers back into business. It would again give them a product to sell, and it would again put vulnerable people at risk. Because, of course, last time and all of this, last time Labor went weak at the knees, 1,200 people died at sea. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. So Bilawila local Angela Fredericks is in Canberra today and is present in the gallery. She is here to present a petition of more than a quarter of a million signatures from Australians who call on the minister to use his discretion and help this rural community reunite with Nardes Priya and their two beautiful girls. Will the Prime Minister meet with Ms Fredericks and listen to her rural community? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr uh, President. Firstly, I mean, these decisions are made in accordance with the law and focused on Australia's national interest. Australia's national interest. That is how we will continue uh, to make these judgments. The Prime Minister has been very clear on what the judgment is that the Australian government has made, a judgment that was confirmed by co the courts again and again, all the way up to the High Court uh, over a period since 2012. Uh, and uh, in relation to the other part of the question, I'll take that on notice. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Minister, how is the government delivering certainty for Australian exporters by growing export markets, including through seeking a free trade agreement with the European Union? Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Fawcett for uh, for his question. Of course, as chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, to his very strong interest in advocacy in, mat in relation to all matters, uh, trade, business, export, growth, uh, and of course across the foreign affairs and defence portfolios. Uh, in relation to, uh, to Australia's negotiations with the European Union, uh, we seek an ambitious and comprehensive free trade agreement. We do so because the EU uh, offers a potential market uh, of more than half a billion customers to Australian businesses. And despite very significant trade restrictions that those Australian businesses already face, the EU is our second largest trading partner and a significant export partner already. So the scope for growth is real if we can manage to see removal and reduction. Uh, of tariffs uh, and increase or elimination of quota volumes. What is really important is to make sure we get a great deal for our farmers and businesses, and the Australian government, the coalition government, is committed to do that, as we have done in all of our other trade negotiations. And industry knows this. We've been very pleased by the reaction from industry as we've worked through this. The Australia-EU Red Meat Access Task Force has described this FTA as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, the Business Council of Australia has identified opportunities for farmers and businesses in relation to government procurement markets uh, and, of course, that trade sustains one in five Australian jobs, and that's the opportunity that we seek to realise to keep those jobs and to grow further employment opportunities in the future. And there are many businesses, such as Almond Co. in our state of South Australia, Senator Fawcett, or Premium Fresh in Tasmania, or Macadamias Direct in uh, subtropical northern New South Wales. These are the types of businesses who have identified that they can gain by growing market access into the European Union. They can be able to export more goods and, in exporting more goods, uh, ensure an increase in revenue into Australia, create more jobs, sustain more jobs, pay more taxes, create the opportunities that is making Australia Order. stronger Senator into the future. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, you're aware that the European Union has 
required that we issue a list of geographical indicators that they wish to protect. That has caused some concern amongst some of my constituents, particularly people in the dairy industry. Could you outline the process that the government is taking to this and reassure them that our approach will support our interests? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. As part of our negotiations, we have recently published a list of EU requested terms. So there are 236 terms relating to spirits products and 172 relating to agricultural or other food names. Uh, now, uh, in publishing this, it's important to identify firstly what's not on the list, because there are a number of concerns that existed in relation to this. We are not being asked to protect a number of names that our dairy industry in particular had been concerned about. For example, Brie, mozzarella, uh, Edam, Gouda, uh, pepperoni, provolone, uh, cheddar and, of course, camembert. We do acknowledge, though, that there are concerns in relation to products such as feta and parmesan. These are genuine concerns, and I emphasise we have made no commitments to the EU other than to publish this list of names. No commitments. We want to hear directly from Australian industry so that we can advocate emphatically on their behalf. And that's why I have been visiting and meeting with many dairy industry representatives and that we will continue Order to make sure Senator we get the Birmingham. best possible Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate of the latest trade statistics and what they show about the government's plan for strong economic growth? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we continue to pursue these negotiations. They're about building on a proven method of success. Our trade, agreements, our trade agreements have created record levels of exports, record trade surpluses for Australia, and it's because of the network of free trade agreements that we have struck as a nation with our North Asian economies in Japan, Korea, China, through the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which, of course, we should never forget that those opposite said of the TPP, we should just give up and walk away when the United States said to give up on it. But we didn't. We negotiated, we secured the deal, and in doing so, we've struck the first ever opportunities for trade agreements between Australia and Mexico, between Australia and Canada, as well as ensuring continued elimination of trade barriers for many of our goods that have seen our goods exports to China, to Japan, to Korea, to ASEAN countries all grow significantly compared with the previous year. Strong growth right across these markets, fuelling job opportunities Order. and a stronger economy for all Australians. Senator Birmingham, time for the answer has expired. That is not an order speaker. The, the Leader of the Government takes precedence, but he needs to be a bit quicker. Senator <laughs> Senator McKenzie. I, I seek leave to uh, tidy up one of my answers. Yes, you don't need leave, Minister. <laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, order. Just please leave quietly. Um, the just in response on to a question from Senator Di Natale, the Secretary's group was looking at issues primarily related to public service administration, in particular whether agencies were appropriately considering climate risk in performing their functions, and did APS staff have the capability to assess and manage climate risk. The group stopped meeting in March 2018, as typically secretary groups on specific issues are established for a limited time, with their work then progressing into business as usual arrangements. In addition, the Australian Government Disaster and Climate Resilience Reference Group is continuing the work of the secretary's group. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Polly. Thanks. Um I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Cormann to the question asked by Senator Gallagher. Thank you. After six very long years of uh, the Liberals running the country's economy, what we've seen in their third term is a repeat of their lacklustre performance in this area over the previous six years. This government has no plan. They have no plan to turn around the economy. Wage growth has hit a record um, low Senator Polly, just resume your seat for a moment. We'll just check that your microphone is on. Yes, we believe it's on. Please continue. Thank you. Wage growth, as I was saying, has reached a record low of 0.6 per cent. No, we know that the net debt has more than doubled, and we've actually crashed through to the half trillion dollar mark with our gross debt. 
We know that the living standards of Australians has fallen dramatically. The first per capita income recession in over a decade. And economic growth is slowing, with the IMF expecting growth to fall further to 2.1 per cent this year. The outlook is full of gloom. Australians and working Australians and their families are suffering under this lacklustre government. But as usual, what do we see from those opposite? Their arrogance. The arrogance not to even listen and to heed the warning that has been expressed throughout the community in terms of the economy and how that's hurting everyday Australians. What we saw from the government during the last term and what uh, their big mantra was all about giving away $80 billion to multinational companies and their $17 billion handout to big business and to big banks. Australia is in a crisis when it comes to housing affordability and homelessness in this country. And this government, who have responsibility to ensure that all Australians have the opportunities they so richly deserve are being ignored. Middle Australia is being ignored by those opposite. What we are asking on this side of the chamber is, why can you not articulate an economic plan? Is it because you're just too arrogant, lazy, or is it the truth that you don't have any idea and you have no plan? You didn't actually take a plan for the economy to the last election. You managed to win, and yes, you can gloat about that, and congratulations. Uh, it's always better to be on that side of the chamber. But with that comes enormous responsibility. Our economy is floundering. People are hurting. We have more and more people ending up homeless. We have the biggest cohort of people uh, finding themselves homeless are women, older women, and we see nothing from those opposite. We have business calling out because they have no confidence. You can't just rely on tax cuts because there is still concern about whether or not people are actually going to spend the tax cuts that we pass through this place. Because I can tell you, when you walk around where I live in Launceston and throughout other places in Tasmania, there is a real downturn in retail. And it's not just about the internet. It's about the fact that people don't have confidence. People just aren't spending because they don't know what's ahead of them. When you have the NAB senior economist, Garth Spencer, and he's telling John Stanley it could take time to really discover whether Australians will spend their tax cuts. But, and I quote, but I guess we're getting increasingly worried that we've seen very little evidence of a significant boost from the tax cuts. And that's what this government have been relying on. It's all been about tax cuts. Well, you need to do a lot more than just that. We've seen over the last six years that you've really been all about uh, attacking those who can least afford it. We know that you're all about uh, attacks on unions and working Australians. We know that you cut penalty rates. None of these things that you have been so prominently advocating for has helped the economy. In fact, all the jobs that you said would be created once penalty rates were, were cut, where are they? Yeah. There isn't any. There is none in the hospitality sector at all. We see that there has been no evidence, which is what you tried to tell the Australian people, that if we cut penalty rates, everything will be all right. Well, the reality is it hasn't. What you're forcing families to do is taking on not only a second job, but in many cases three Thank jobs. Thank you, Senator You are Polly. the government. Your time you has have expired. responsibility. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Well, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I take great pride in standing here today and defending the record of the government and what the government is delivering, uh, particularly when it comes here to the economy and taking note of the, the answer that the Minister for Finance gave. Uh, on the issue of the economy. Uh, he spoke about the national accounts that show that the Australian economy has completed its 28th consecutive year of economic growth, a record unmatched by any developed economy. It's a reminder of the economy's remarkable resilience and its uh, repudiation of all those that have sought to talk it down. He spoke about the 
investment in the infrastructure. In my own home state, uh, we have a part of that $100 billion of infrastructure that's going in uh, across Australia. We have a, a record level of investment into Western Australia. Uh, I want to talk about the $349 million investment in the Tonkin Highway upgrades. This is not far from where I live, and it was very sad. Earlier in the year, there was a, a tragic uh, vehicle accident at a major intersection. This is a, a very busy road that, uh, that's a freight route, and uh, there was a tragic accident where uh, a woman was killed uh, earlier this year. And with the investment in infrastructure on in this particular road, they're putting a great separation that's going to uh, ensure that, that possibly those sort of accidents won't occur. Now, there's a, that's a $349 million commitment in the Tonkin Highway. There's a $208 million commitment in the Oates Street and Walshpool Road and Mint Street level uh, uh, crossing removals. Now, that's going to make a big difference to the commuting times of uh, personnel, people trying to get to work and, importantly, getting home uh, at the end of the day. They can get home uh, in a timely way and, of course, in a safe fashion as well. There's a $149 million uh, uh, commitment to the Albany Ring Road. Now, this is a, uh, an important, very important project. Uh, as, uh, uh, as those that are local to that area know, that this is something that they've called for for a long time. But it's because of the strong economy, uh, it's because of the record of this government that we're able to deliver such important projects, projects that communities across my state of Western Australia are desperate to see, including, of course, the Bunbury Outer Ring Road. We've got a $122 million commitment to the Bunbury Outer Ring Road and a $115 million uh, commitment to build uh, or upgrade the Fremantle Traffic Bridge. So the government is allocating $535 million for projects from the roads of strategic importance initiative, including $248 million for the Carratha uh, Tom Price Corridor and $75 million for the Alice Springs to Halls Creek Corridor. This is only possible because of the, uh, the, the difficult decisions that we have had to make as a government. Uh, Minister Cormann took us through those diff some of those difficult decisions that have had to have been made, and we were able to deliver a strong economy because of those difficult decisions. We've seen significantly these numbers uh, do not incorporate the passage through the parliament of the most significant tax cuts in more than 20 years and the full impact of the 50 basis point reduction in interest rates. This, uh, we, we've yet to see with the current accounts the impact of those uh, uh, tax uh, relief that's coming into family households. Uh, you'd speak to people out uh, in the communities we've done over this break uh, since we've been here, and you talk about the people that have received that uh, extra uh, uh, refund back from the uh, from the ATO already, and it's making a difference in people's lives. People are able to make their uh, better contribution to their own families in their right Senate van. They're able to see that earn. They've got more of the money uh, in their pockets than what they earn, and this is what we're committed to doing. Now, Australia is not immune to the fallout of the global trade tensions, and we're certainly not complacent. But with strong foundations, our economy is positioned, as well as any nation, to withstand these challenges. This is not an easy time for economies all over the world, uh, with Germany, uh, the UK and Singapore, among others, recording negative growth in the June quarter. However, in setting out the budget, we anticipated the economic challenges ahead and put in place significant tax cuts in infrastructure spending together with the 50 basis points in tax cuts improving housing market uh, uh, which will be reflected in the September quarter onwards. So we're looking forward to seeing the future results as they come out this next quarter because there is no doubt we're sure that there'll be a big impact by the plans and what the government's been doing. Thank you Senator O'Sullivan. Senator McCarthy. Thank you Madam Acting Madam Deputy President, uh, just to follow on, we've seen uh, Senator Gallagher ask questions of uh, the minister in question time in relation to the economy. But the reality here is that the figures in this country around confidence, business confidence, uh, is dropping. It is dropping so low that uh, businesses, certainly in the north, have had to travel here 
to remind the parliament, to talk to the prime minister, to talk to ministers about the serious need uh, for businesses, in particular in Northern Australia. The NAB chief economist, Alan Oster, says it looks like the tax cuts have had little impact on household consumption or have not been large enough to offset increasing weakness in the retail sector. Now, this isn't about hitting the government over the head consistently just so, for the fun of it. It's the reality that people out there are desperately suffering from the fact the wages growth or lack thereof is impacting on family lives. Family lives. We hear senators stand up in this house to talk about the importance of having a family, of having a house, of being able to raise your children. Well, senators, let me tell you, there are thousands of Australians in this country who certainly want to do that, who desperately need to do that. But when they are on New Start without any increase at all, when they are on CDP, the Community Development Program, which is $11 an hour, how can they? When people in our businesses, retail sectors, the workers who lose their penalty rates cannot look after their family, that is what you're talking about. The Australians who are missing out in this country, the Australians who need to know that this parliament, this government cares. Instead, you block your ears, you block your hearts, you close your eyes. You do not want to see the impact that withholding all that you do in terms of the amount of money that can flow to all these families across this country, you withhold that. And you give all sorts of reasons in this Senate as to why you should. You talk about your tax cuts, but we know that they are not being felt. We've heard from the economists. We've seen the data in August in relation to the wages situation. Let's have a look at the families on CDP in this country. 33,000 people. Now, we were told in the last term of government that you would find 6,000 jobs of those, for those 33,000 people. Well, where are they? Where are those jobs? Because those same people are still on $11 an hour. How can they look after their families? How can they be able to afford the grocery, the power bills, to even put fuel in their vehicles? And now you talk about changes to other social issues, social payments, and you want to drug test them? You know, you are, you are pushing the poorest people, the most disadvantaged people in this country, even further down, and you refuse to see it. If we are so successful in this country with the kind of surplus that you're pushing for, then it's not showing. It is not showing in the lives of these Australians. It is not showing in the infrastructure needs that we require in Northern Australia. Infrastructure Australia provides millions of dollars in Southern Australia. But in the North, where we are desperate for the support to be able to build the roads so that those people who live out on those farming properties in the Barclay, in Central Australia, over in the VRD region, so that they have good roads to get their cattle to market, to get the families to school. They're the Australians that we need you to focus on. So don't come in here and say that there isn't a problem with wages in this country. There is a very big problem, and you are continually enabling the disadvantage Thank of you, those Senator Australians. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Your time has expired. Senator Ban. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, we've heard a lot about jobs just in this uh, take note, and then it's what the senator should be taking note of is that you know, wages have increased across the economy by 2.3 per cent in the past year. 
So while the inflation rate is only 1.6 per cent, wages are going up in very real terms. Now, as the senator should know, that wages can only go up when conditions are set that way, when with the headwinds we're facing. Our economy is very well set to perform better than all others. As my good colleague Senator O'Sullivan just said, you know, that the economy is not immune from the global trade tensions. And they will and are having an effect on all economies. But the thing is, the Australian economy is far more resilient than every other economy. So while countries such as Germany and Singapore are going backwards, Australia is still growing. And I repeat, 28th year of constant growth. Now, that is not something to be sneezed at. You can't do that you know, against, those trade, against those headwinds and trade tensions if you don't set the right sort of frameworks. Now, the Morrison government has set the right sort of frameworks. Jobs are growing. Jobs are coming. We've produced over 1.4 million jobs over the last year. And we have said you know, before the election and since that we'll create another one and a quarter million jobs. With those jobs come growth in wages. But one doesn't follow the other. You don't move wages and then hope for the jobs. That doesn't happen. That is not the real world. Our budget is coming back into surplus for the first time in more than a decade. And as we maintain our record of fiscal discipline and targeted spending, so there is no room to be moving wages arbitrarily, as the, those on the other side would have us do. And we continue to monitor you know, global events, and this government takes the necessary actions to be able to do so. In, in our budget, we set out the conditions of how we were going to, to meet this, and, and that has shown up in the recent current account, national accounts. And with that 28th year of consecutive growth, and I say again, it's a record unmatched by any other developed economy. But it's also a reminder of the resilience of the Australian economy. In the June quarter, real GDP grew by 0.5 per cent, and for the year that is 1.4 per cent higher for the financial year. So as you can see, we do create the conditions to be able to create, create more jobs. Tax cuts that have come in, people are starting to feel. Over five, billion, 5 million tax returns have already been received, and $15 billion is now flowing through the economy that wasn't there before. And certain wouldn't, certainly wouldn't be flowing through the economy if those on the other side had have been elected. But as we know, and as I said in my first speech last night, when the, the electorate sees what it sees as its priorities being observed, it shows a prevailing common sense. And that prevailing common sense you know, it produces a government that produces results for them. And with that, we are able to bring more jobs and better conditions for business. Now, business, I know I need to explain to the other side what it does and how it is the producer of jobs. You can't just be putting people into the public service just for, because you want more friends. So the Morrison government is the government that produces more jobs because it sets the conditions for business. The businesses, like the one I used to run, like the small businesses are the engine of our economy, they see that we can set the conditions, they take faith and they create the jobs. So in answer, the conditions are right. We've set the framework and jobs will come and salaries will increase. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Van. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. Well, haven't you seen it all? A third term government, no agenda, no plan. They give, they've given answers about how to bring forward and get the economy going. Of course, we've been saying it from our side, 
But now you've got the NAB, the Master Builders Association, also saying it. That's on top of the Reserve Bank saying it. But no, they still won't listen. They still won't even listen because they have. They, this is the actually interesting thing. I don't actually think they know that they're in government because they never expected to get there. So they've actually just sitting there in sort of dream world about, oh, let's just pull out the plan of no plan, just come up with a sort of a, a make-believe situation about what we're going to do with the economy. Don't worry what all the experts say. Look, don't listen to us. Just listen to the experts. They're saying you have to bring infrastructure forward. That creates jobs. It boosts the economy. We are in need to do this. Listen to what the experts are saying. Now you've seen a situation where, you know, if we actually start creating these jobs in a substantial way, we boost the economy. We start getting small businesses operating. I'm very proud to say in my previous life I was the member of the largest small business organisation of the, in this country. In actual fact, probably larger than all the small businesses put together, made up of owner drivers. And those owner drivers could be working in construction sites, but not to the degree that the government wants, because they are in a dream world. They're not listening to anyone. They're still asleep. You are in government. Start governing. Start making steps that make a difference in this economy. We've just seen in the last six years that this liberal economic mismanagement has left this, this economy in a perilous position. An economy equal parts unstable and unfair. Despite claiming to be superior economic managers, the record on the economy is nothing to crow about. According to the ABS national accounts, economic growth is at its lowest level since the global financial crisis, with our year-on-year -year growth is just 1.4 per cent in the June quarter of this year. Now, again, the dream world. Oh, no, everything's OK. We're in actual fact, the ABS statistics, regardless of the fact that it's telling us that we're in crisis, our growth is OK. Start listening to the experts. Wake up. Come out of your dream. One sixth of the pace wages are growing at one sixth of the pace of profits. The worst wages growth on record. People are doing it tough out there. They're struggling to make their bills and pay their bills. They're struggling to make it. And quite clearly, this government hasn't got an answer. These figures are all according to the ABS national accounts for the June quarter of 2019. More than 1.8 million Australians are out of work or looking for more work. Household debt is surged to record levels. And of course, don't take my word for it. This is from the Westpac Melbourne Institute Index of Consumer Sentiment from last month. Wake up. Weak growth like this is an inevitable consequence of a government with a political strategy but not an economic plan. A strategy that seems to be all about attacking workers' representatives, whistleblowers, journalists, unemployed people Unionists. and others who dare to question the vacuum that, this is, that is this government. Under Labor, Australia became one of the fastest growing economies in the OECD. But under the Liberals, we have dropped down to the 20th place. Wake up. Our industrial relations system is the engine of our economy. Because we know that lift the wages, lift consumptions, lifts growth. We've seen clearly from the Reserve Bank saying to us, and of course saying to us just recently, the RBA Governor Philip Lowe. My view is that a further pickup in wages growth is both affordable and desirable. But what does the government do? It turns around and attacks the voice of people that want wages growth. What is the Ensuring Integrity Bill about? Thank you, it's about Senator consuming Sheldon. Cost Your time, and time has expired. So the question is: the motion, as put by Senator Polly, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young.
Thank you, Madam. Uh, yes, sorry. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I rise to give um, to take note of answers given to the question from Senator De Natale earlier uh, today during question time. So, who were the? Who the question was to um, uh, to Minister Mackenzie. Um, thank you. We've seen the government pull up the white flag today on the Murray-Darling Basin. We've got fires raging across Queensland and New South Wales, and the minister that is responsible for both water and, national and natural disasters and drought, Minister Littleproud, can't even tell us whether he accepts the science on climate change. So while Fires are raging. Fireys are telling us that we've got to get serious about the dangers of global warming and climate change. We've got farmers crying out. They know that the climate is in dire strife. The scientists know that we have to take action to reduce carbon pollution and to get our house in order when it comes to climate change. The one minister responsible for this has told the Australian people he doesn't know. He doesn't know if climate change is man-made. How on earth can this bloke continue to be the minister for water and the minister responsible for the policy and government response on drought and natural disasters when he doesn't even accept the basic science? It is an absolute joke that this government has David Littleproud, uh, the minister, uh, in charge of these issues. And today we hear there's not just the water minister, we now see the environment minister, Susan Lay, putting up the white flag on our nation's biggest river system, on the Murray Darling Basin. So after years of this government, the coalition government, mismanaging the Murray Darling Basin, saying there was nothing, nothing going wrong, nothing to see here, don't worry about it, folks. We now hear the water minister doesn't even believe in climate change, let alone the impact on drought, and the environment minister says, oh, you know what, there's not enough water to look after the river system and people are just going to have to go without. And this is an absolute catastrophe, and it has happened on the watch of the coalition government and the water portfolio being managed by the National Party. And the environment minister today is saying that because there's no water, we won't be able to do the things the river needs in order to keep it uh, flowing and keep it alive. She's softening the public up for mass fish kills this summer. She's telling family farmers downstream, sorry about it, but there's not enough water to go around. Meanwhile, their big corporate makes have been taking out too much water being too greedy, and now there's none left for anybody else. None left for the environment, none left for the fish, and none left for the small farmers. Year after year, farmers, environmentalists, those of us here in the Senate have been standing up and calling out for action to save the Murray-Darling in the face of a drying climate and, and, and climate change. And this government has failed to act. They did worse than that. They deny the science of climate change. They stick their head in the sand over that, and they turned a blind eye to the corruption and greed that has go been going on throughout the basin. The National Party have been trying to dupe regional and rural Australia for far too long. Heads in the sand, climate change denialists, and looking after their big corporate mates. Well, I tell you what, Mr President, the chooks are coming home to roost. Fires are raging across northern Australia. The river is in crisis, and family farms know their back is against the wall. And whose fault is it? It is at the fault of this government. Their ignorance, their climate change scepticism and denial and their absolute contempt for everyday Australians who want proper action on saving our environment and making sure there is a river here for future generations. It will be 
on the head of this government and every single one of their water ministers, whether that's been Barnaby Joyce or David Littleproud or their environment ministers, Susan Lay, Frydenberg and, of course, Melissa Price. They've done nothing. The death of the river is on their watch. Order, Senator Hanson. And they ought time to the, take responsibility. I, I, I remind senators to refer to members of this and the other place by their proper titles, or at least their proper names. Uh, the question is: the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.